Hello everyone, my name is Ben Eady and I'm the Online Media Manager for ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Create a BA Center of Excellence and Improve Your Business Performance and Innovation. Today's featured speaker is John Parker and the webinar will last approximately 60 minutes including the Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the webinar software. And I'd like to also say thank you to Infocus Solutions for sponsoring this event. And at this time, I'll turn it over to John to get us started. Uh, thank you, Ben. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the webinar. And it's either good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. So anyway, let's, let's get started. OK, for today's webinar, we're going to look at the value proposition for business analysis. We're going to look at the current state of business analysis maturity, look at business analysis competency and maturity models in terms of really how you can build you know, more uh, business analysis capabilities within your company, business analysis centers of excellence and communities of practice. Is it really a technique to do that? And then, of course, uh, spend a little bit more time on building business analysis capabilities and what it takes. And then we'll actually uh, have a question and answer session. So let's get started. First of all, I want to say that business analysis is very important. Sometimes it doesn't actually get uh, the focus that it needs within an organization, but it solves a lot of problems. It also, if you have problems in business analysis, it also causes a lot of problems. If you have like a lack of maturity in requirements development and management, this is a major uh, cause really of failed or challenged projects, lower productivity resulting in more rework, developer frustration, although you could add business unit frustration to that too, higher cost and schedule delays and really unused functionality. You know, over the last few years, we've done a lot to improve the maturity of project management. You know, however, business analysis, you know, the same focus really hasn't existed. The other thing I want to say is, is that don't equate business analysis just to requirements. Uh, requirements is a key part of business analysis, but business analysis is a lot more. When you, look, when you look at business analysis as a whole, what we, what we see is the business impact, and you don't really have the right focus on that. Benefits aren't realized. We develop solutions that aren't aligned with business needs. We have low stakeholder satisfaction. And we basically have solutions that don't solve the business problem. Okay, if you look at the current state of business analysis maturity, in most organizations, it's actually fairly low. I've actually had several surveys done recently, and I've actually got several third-party surveys that were done. And this, this really seems to be you know, the, the basic trend. There seems to be a lot of emphasis in trying to improve it. Uh, like I said, requirements management does not necessarily equate to business analysis maturity. In other words, you could be excellent at defining requirements. You could still have low business analysis maturity. The reason why, though, that, you know, the profession is relatively new. Uh, you know, the International Organization of Business Analysts was formed in 2004. Uh, there's still less than 2,500 certified BAs, and that compares with 300,000 project managers. So, I mean, we're really pretty much you know, a new profession. Uh, we don't really have an industry capability model. We have a competency model that IBAs develop, but we don't have like an industry-wide you know, capability model. There are some, but really nothing's really recognized. Uh, for instance, Kitty Hass has developed one, and in Focus, we've developed one. Uh, IAG requirements has a requirements management model. CMMI, you know, kind of has requirements development and requirements management practices, but there really is no recognized standard. So really, why focus on business analysis? Well, we want to focus on business analysis because it's key to delivering more successful projects. Uh, actually, if you look at the top three causes of, of uh, failed projects, it's basically poor requirements, lack of user input, and changing requirements. And all of those, you know, basically is, is, is a symptomatic for business analysis. Also, another th problem that causes uh, project delays and cost overruns is scope creep. That's another thing. I mean, <clears throat> the project managers determine, okay, the project scope, business analysts determine the solution scope, and it's changes in that solution scope that actually causes scope creep that causes project delays and cost overruns and really frustrates the project managers. There's also major, major emphasis in terms of we can actually eliminate waste. <clears throat> um, Rework, a lot of that is caused from poor requirements. We also, according to the Standish Group, 49% of functionality that is developed is never used. So we can eliminate unnecessary functionality. Those two things together, less rework and eliminating unnecessary functionality, if you look at any project, that is justification right there to focus on, on business analysis. In fact, the return on investment from focusing on business analysis is huge almost unbelievable just taking those, those two pieces together. 
In other words, if you make any any cut at all, you may be looking at 10 to 20 percent of a whole project savings per project. That's huge. Okay, deliver, <clears throat> delivering more business value. Obviously, um, a lot of times you, do, you don't just stop with requirements. If you can actually do business analysis and you view this as achieving more benefits for the business, you could actually get a 3x or three times improvement Okay, when benefits realization is, is, is applied. Also, if we focus more on, on, on identifying quick wins for the business, okay, we actually include that as part of every one of our projects, we can achieve results faster. And of course, you know, the big thing about business analysis is hopefully we provide better solutions. Okay, but we do have challenges. Uh, let's look at some of the challenges we really have as a profession, and I'm going to say kind of we. And one of the first things is, you know, we're, we're a new profession. There's kind of a lack of understanding of our role. We have a low maturity level in general, and there's we have a lot of titles. We don't really have, you know, a single title called business analyst. We have business analyst and systems analyst and ERP analyst and a lot of other roles. Okay, so that, that makes it tough. Oftentimes, we report to different people of the organization. Some of us may report to IT. Some of us may report to business units. Uh, oftentimes, we have like little silos kind of all over the place. This also creates problems for us because we do things inconsistently. There's also a perception problem. Actually, I, I got to review uh, some HR positions for several several companies. And in some companies, they actually uh, classify business analysts as equal to a help desk analyst. Uh, that, that's horrible. I mean, I think business analysts are so much more strategic than that. And so, you know, we really need to get a little bit more respect. Um, our, you know, but part of it is our value is not fully understood. Another thing is, you know, development's rapidly moving to Agile, and there is no formal business analysis role in Agile. Well, there's a product owner and a scrum master, but there is no role uh, in, in Agile called business analyst, even though it's very important. And the other thing is, the other challenge we have is really integrating business analysis into existing processes. You know, the project management practices, practices are normally very well entrenched. Systems development life cycles are very well entrenched. Business process improvement and Six Sigma, Sigma that, that's pretty well entrenched, okay? So our big thing is we have to kind of span all of these things and make sure that what we do really fits into that and that our practices, you know, fit into that environment to really, to really make it work and optimize these other environments. So, you know, really what this takes is we really, as an industry, we need to really look at kind of a cultural shift. We need to focus more on the business and really less on systems. And so we need to transition from a systems analyst really to a business analyst role. One of the things in terms of really adding value, we need to focus on improving business outcomes. Now, if we can demonstrate that we're delivering business value and we actually help the business measure their results, that, and we can demonstrate quantifiable impact and enable business change, that's improving business outcomes, and we will really be recognized in terms of the industry as really providing you know, much more help to the business. So the big thing is, is work with the business, help them you know, determine the business outcomes they want to achieve, develop solutions to help them achieve that, and it makes a gigantic difference. The other big thing is, is that collaboration between technical and business stakeholders, that's really our role. We have to kind of, we have to kind of bridge between those, those two areas. And even though, you know, in Agile, they, they really pretty much say, that, you know, that you know, they want the business stakeholders to communicate with the technical, uh, that doesn't really work that well. We really play a very meaningful role really in kind of bridging this gap because we're able to talk to technical people, we're able to talk to business stakeholders, and, you know, really by doing this, we can increase the transparency, you know, with business stakeholders. We can facilitate better user input, and really this helps a lot in terms of delivering better solutions. And really, last but not least, okay, instead of just defining requirements, we really need to promote innovation and help the business generate ideas and really bring those ideas to, to reality. Okay, so if you look at business analysis, it's really a lot more than just requirements. But if you kind of look at this, if you take a typical project, okay, the first thing we really need to do is really look at where are we currently performing? Where's the business performing? That kind of gets back to this measurement thing. And then look at where should the business be performing? And it, obviously we're missing our gap, otherwise we probably wouldn't have the project to begin with. So we need to understand the cause of this performance gap and work with the business to really understand, you know, why is that? The next thing is, is that as we start defining our solutions, we need to narrow that gap by really focusing on the right features. Oftentimes, you know, if we just, 
in the past, many people have just developed a wish list. This really isn't appropriate. You really need to make sure that the features that get defined and the associated requirements with those actually help resolve okay, that performance gap. The next thing is, is work with the business and the technical teams to try to shorten the time to value by reducing rework. If we can deliver some of these features early, that's great. If we can work with the business then to maximize quick wins, that's great because both those things are basically delivering more value early. Now the other big thing is, is that at the time that we implement or deploy, we need to really work with the business to try to transition to this new solution. And almost any solution during this transition period, there's usually a productivity drop. So if we work with the business and we help them define good transition requirements and, uh, and make sure that they're prepared from an organizational change perspective, we can really minimize that productivity drop. That's a big thing we can do. And then after the solution is deployed, I mean, really our goal then there is to help the business maximize those realized, those realized benefits. Go back and actually you know, do benefits realization management. Now, if you look at business analysis along this, okay, there's a lot of different features here, but this, this, is, this is much more, like I said, take, taking this role adds tremendous value to the business. And to get here, you know, like I said, it won't be easy for some organizations, but the big thing is just to kind of have this holistic view. Okay, so if we're going to get there we want, and we want to build business analysis capabilities, okay, what's needed? First of all, we need to have strategic alignment. We need to have government, we need to be aligned with the business and aligned with the technical staff in terms of actually how they work and aligned with project management, very important. We need to have governance. We need to have processes and practices that we follow, and these need to be, you know, basically, you know, kind of proven practices that work within an organization. We need to have some type of technology really to support us. Obviously, we need to have skills and competencies. And then, I, like I said, like I mentioned earlier, we really need to really work on developing a culture for business analysis within an organization. So these are really the six things, and I'm going to cover these in quite a bit more detail in the, in the back of the presentation. But let's move on. Okay, if you look at the industry, like I said, there is no capability model. However, there is a competency model. And the competency model is quite a bit different because it's really geared towards individual skills and competencies. So our IBA has a competency model. It's actually pretty good. They have 53 defined performance competencies. And this helps quite a bit. However, if you look at like the previous page, that's really only addresses one of these blocks, you know, just skills and competencies. It doesn't really deal with strategic alignment, governance, processes and practices, or technology. So it really doesn't necessarily give us organizational capabilities, but it certainly helps. Okay, so in terms of you know, what I mean by business analysis capability, let's just let's look at this thing against the capability maturity model. Okay, so the vast majority of most organizations really are at about level one in terms of business analysis. They have, a, they, have a, they have an unpredictable process. It's kind of poorly controlled and reactive. Some organizations have pockets that are pretty mature, but if you really look at it from an organization-wide perspective, uh, I think the industry average, from what I can tell, is somewhere around 1.4 in terms of the, the capability maturity level scale, just for the whole industry. Uh, when you go to level two, you're really talking about business requirements are defined and managed. And, and, and the key thing there is really business requirements. Uh, you know, IBA, they talk about five types of requirements. They, you know, they talk about business requirements, stakeholder requirements, solution requirements, you know, and transition requirements. And, and solution requirements, so there's like, you know, two types there. You know, there's basically functional and non-functional. Understanding each one of these things is very important because you know, the, the business requirements that really help you define what does the business need, what type of value do they expect to achieve. Stakeholder basically is understanding the users and their needs. Of course, the solution is what, we, what we're really familiar with. That's kind of the functional and non-functional that we all work with. And then, of course, the transition requirements really helps us then transition to this new solution. Those are key. The okay, third thing then is really we, we, we hit a point that we're actually aligned with the business. We're, we're really focused much more on delivering value in our solutions, okay? So we have the requirements process down, we moved to maturity level three and really focused on that. Maturity level four is we're much more now involved really in planning, we're much more involved at the, at the portfolio level and working with the business in terms of you know, where do they need to go. And then the last level five basically is a focus on innovations used to gain competitive advantage. So this is kind of a, kind of another way to look at that, you know, with a little bit more detail. 
But one of the things you kind of see at the bottom, okay, um, to move to level two and to really have an organizational capability, it usually takes some type of coordination effort. A good way to do that is like a community of practice. Uh, another thing is centers of excellence. And normally that's when we actually move to you know, more, more in the line state, kind of maturity level three. Maturity level four then really takes us really much more, which is really much more involved early in projects and kind of in the portfolio. And that's kind of where the center of excellence kind of get, gets consumed by what I would call the enterprise portfolio management office. And then when you're innovating, okay, then you're really you're moving at maturity level five, okay, you're really working with the businesses to identify areas where they can gain a competitive advantage. So that's that's key. So this is this is um, this is kind of the capability maturity model that we use that we like to see organizations adopt. And of course, then what we've done, we've actually then gone through and then defined for each one of these tiers. Okay, what are key capabilities that your organization needs to have? Okay, so let's look at how to achieve and, and, and mature okay, these business analysis capabilities. Okay, a key starting point basically is just to create a community of practice or a center of excellence. Now, a community of practice is a group of like practitioners that come together to share resources. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of communities of practice, and the key thing is, is that it's really a great starting point. It, it's not an organization structure. It's kind of like volunteer memberships, and you have to kind of get business units to participate, and it normally takes a little bit of money to get started, but, it, but it, it's a great starting point. A lot of organizations kind of move beyond that, and they actually create a little bit more of an organization structure where maybe they have like a, the, the, the counterpart of a PMO, which is like a center of excellence for project managers. And that's normally really, that's really much more of an organizational change because it normally that's an organizational unit, has dedicated people, not volunteers, and they really focus, okay, really on practice. They're similar in a way, but one is really much more kind of voluntary. And the other one really is, you know, it's just kind of an organizational change. So let's just kind of compare the three organization structures for business analysis. Okay, a lot of organizations, they, they, they really have scattered silos. We actually have business analysts in the business. We have business analysts in IT. Um, we, the goal is, is to really work with business units, which is very important, but we, we pretty much have inconsistent ways of doing things. We vary a lot from business unit to business unit. Okay, the other two organization structures, what I just mentioned, which is a center of excellence, which is really, okay, taking the business analyst and kind of changing organizational relationships are building a center of excellence really to support them kind of with dedicated staff or people. And the third one then is the community of practice. And these are kind of like informal peer groups, okay, that come together, share information. It's kind of like voluntary enrollment. Okay, so... You know, what, what do these organizations really do? What do centers of excellence and, and communities of practice do? Well, first of all, they really do five things. First of all, they, they provide support. They provide support to their members in providing better service to business units. That's kind of first and foremost. Next of all, they provide guidance. Oftentimes, they maintain standards, methodologies, tools, and knowledge repositories really for their members to use. Helps make them more successful. They generally have shared learning because they want to coordinate training and certifications and skills assessments. And oftentimes they're able to pool resources, go together, and actually buy uh, e-learning programs really for the entire company. So instead of trying to justify this one time, okay, the community practice kind of goes to bat and tries to get you know, learning for people. The next thing is they define measurements. So they really try to show, okay, what is the value of business analysis? What's the return on investment that we're getting? How is this helping the business? And by defining those measures and putting in a measurement program, this makes a huge difference. It's so much easier to get buy-in and acceptance, and it's pretty easy to do this. And then the last thing then is really governance, and that's, that really is focused much more on a center of excellence than it is a community of practice, but, 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 but important, because that's, that's, that's really what a center of excellence does, is to provide governance, governance for that function. If you look at a community of practice, it actually has three key ingredients. First of all, it has to have a domain, okay? And of course, in our case, okay, the domain would be, it's a shared domain, and the domain would be business analysis. So it's anybody that would be interested in business analysis, that's, that's the domain. The next thing, it has to have a community, so that means it has to have people. So these are people that are interested in business analysis that want to join. 
And then the focus is, it's just a practice, okay? The domain then has a set of practice, okay, that we want our community members to, to employ and use. So uh, uh, generally, so community practice always has, you know, something to try to try to improve the practice within, within some domain, you know, by a shared group of people. That's, that's, the three key, that's the three key pieces. There are actually different types of communities, okay? One type of community is called a helping community. And the purpose of this community, its major focus is just to help the community members or business analysts really do their job better, helps them solve issues and allows them, when somebody runs into a big problem, it allows them to have, you know, somebody to talk to. There's a best practice community, and this really allows you to develop and disseminate best practices or guidelines for members' use. So it's kind of like taking um, bits and pieces from members and sharing them and acknowledging that these things are best practices for our company or whatever and going forward with that. Um, a lot of them are really focused on knowledge stewarding communities. So, so what they try to do, they try to, they try to take a body of knowledge dealing with various business analysis methods or techniques or whatever, and they steward this knowledge and really kind of make it available. So they kind of become, you know, really knowledge management is a key focus of that. So the last one that are really called innovation communities, and what they're really looking for is breakthrough ideas, new knowledge, new practices. So it would be like, you know, kind of a, a group of business analysts both coming together and looking at, okay, how maybe our company's in the ditch, which a lot of us are because of the economy. So it's kind of coming together and collectively focusing on trying to generate ideas and innovation really to bring back to the business that could be used. So that's kind of the four types of communities. Centers of excellence, they normally are organized kind of around different stages of development. Okay, so they almost always start with a project center. They always start on, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna deliver business analysis skills to these individual projects and we're gonna make the project successful. Then they kind of move to another stage called the enterprise focused. Okay, well really what they want is now they want not only to help out projects, they really want to make sure that, you know, because we're delivering projects well, they want to make sure that we're really serving the enterprise and we're actually able then to, to have reusable objects and things like that that are kind of focused at the enterprise level. And then the last one then is really we move really to more of a business strategy focus where basically we're working with the business and focusing much more on the portfolio and planning and other pieces to make sure we're delivering a lot of value. Okay, so uh, one of the things, there's, there's a lot of information on communities of practice if you dig, and I'm going to give you, you know, some of the big sources. Okay, kind, of the, kind of the leading guru is a guy named Winger, and I think his first name is Etienne. I can't really, I'm, I hope I pronounced that right, but I, um, anyway, you, you, can see, you can see it on the slide. Anyway, he actually has developed several books, and his books are excellent. And so if you're looking at starting a community practice, these are very good. Okay, another person that's done a lot of work is uh, you know, Kitty Hass. You know, Kitty writes a lot of blog articles, and she's a great resource for this. But uh, she actually has done a lot in terms of centers of excellence and you know, business analysis maturity and kind of taking a strategic role. There's a new book that Barbara Davis just came out with called Managing Business Analysis Services. So it really talks about, okay, we should really view business analysis as a set of services that we're delivering to the business. And so she kind of takes this concept and really expands it. Uh, there is no like building business analysis centers of excellence book, but the closest thing is there's one on project management that Dennis Boyles came out with. And uh, that's, that's a really a quite a book because a lot of those principles really apply. I and mean, then probably the leading research organization really on communities of practice and knowledge management is a company called APQC. They're actually one of our research partners. And so we have a lot of content that we actually draw from from our own research, you know, pulling information from them. But they have a lot of information on best practices and what's worked in other companies and what, what hasn't. So even though theirs is, tends to be more generally focused just on communities of practice in general, not business analysis, a lot of their best practice information does work. So this, these are all great resources. Okay, now the next thing I want to do is basically show you uh, our, our community practice that we actually offer as part of our product. Now one of the things, you know, we actually have a requirements management tool, but one of the things we realized quickly on, a requirements management tool really doesn't help you have, uh, be necessarily good at business analysis. First of all, you know, they, they cover only a small part of it, but the other thing is, is that it really takes a lot more. I mean, you really have to have governance and you have to have skills and competencies. And, you know, I can give you, the t I'd give you a great tool, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to write a good requirement and really how, if you know how to use that tool. So we realized this quickly on. It's so like I said, when we developed our software, what we decided to do was we decided, okay, we have to have to offer, you know, a software tool 
plus a community of practice to really help your organization really mature their processes and understand kind of rationale behind things. So even though this, this is our products tool, you will actually see a lot of things that you can actually use. I'm going to kind of go through the content that's in there. So first of all, you know, we kind of organize, we actually have multiple communities. We actually have what's called an analyst community, which is focused really on business analysis practices and methods. And then we actually have another one called the portfolio community, which is much more focused on business process improvement. So in that community, you might have other people that are really geared in, like in, in business process improvement or re-engineering and that type of stuff, kind of pulling in Six Sigma people. But, uh, and of course, you can access both communities. You just select the community that you want to get to, and, and, and we actually offer both. But we have, actually have different domain knowledge, and it actually varies quite a bit between these two communities. So we decided to break it up that way. OK, so in our analyst community, we start off, we have a knowledge portal. So we, we post a whole bunch of different content. And this content you know, is pretty much well-researched. We research best practices. We research business analysis techniques. We research visualization methods, like what's the best way to visualize requirements. We research uh, when do you, how do you use business analysis on agile projects? How do you use it on like commercial software packages that you buy? Okay. We actually also then have discussion forums. And then we actually then have a lot of e-learning courses because we want to make sure that you improve the uh, competency of your staff. So that's actually provided. And then we actually have a mobile app, so we really believe that all this information should be available on a, at least on a tablet. And so actually we have, our, we have an app that will run on the iPhone or the tablet, but anyway, all this knowledge is actually available to take with you when you go into the field. That's important. Okay, digging down further, we actually break our content into these eight areas. And this is kind of high-level view. But first of all, okay, we have analyst briefs, and so we study uh, various pieces of interest in the things just to kind of give you ideas and we publish those things as analyst briefs. Next of all, we have a, I'm going to call it a methodology, it's really more of a framework, but we actually have a business analysis framework that basically kind of gives you the basic task, okay, so our, you know, our whole product's kind of based on that, on that framework, but it's also very helpful because it really allows us to kind of organize all of our content that way too. We also have like business analysis techniques, so we give you information on how to apply, you know, how do you do cost-benefit analysis, or how do you do user stories, or how do you do use cases. Okay, we actually then have practice aids, so the practice aids are really much more like checklists or templates that you can actually use every day. And so a lot of our checklists are, you know, they're, they're very detailed and they really help you, but they're really geared towards helping a business analyst practice business analysis on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, we have practice guides, which are much more detailed things of how to, if you, you know, if your organization, for instance, uses use case, okay, we have like a 40-page practice guide on, okay, how to prepare good use cases, what level of detail do you need to go to, when do you define alternative paths, et cetera. We actually have another thing on visualization methods in terms of what's the best way to visualize your requirements. When do you do use like a prototype or a wireframe, or when do you do a, you know, just you know, sketching and, and all these other different techniques that are out there. Okay, we have you know, detailed reference guides that kind of walk you through, you know, like writing a good requirement, for instance, okay, we have about a 40-page guide, you know, just in terms of really how do you write you know, good requirements? What are the quality attributes? Um, how, do you know, how do you know that it's complete? How do you know your set of requirements is complete? So we have a lot of information there just to make, you know, to kind of help. And then we actually then also, you know, partner with some third-party organizations and provide, you know, third-party materials. So this is what we have in our community, but I think a lot of you, you, you do have something similar in yours. This is the type of information we think is really important to share. Okay, the next thing we have is we actually have a forum because we actually want people to be able to share information between each other. So like in the forum, we have that organized, you can see, by business analysis best practices. We actually also organize by... Um, by, uh, ooh, gotta go back. We, we actually then organize by analyst type because different, different, there's a lot of different types of analysts, and you'll find out, I mean, they have different needs. So, for instance, if you're, a, if you're primarily a systems analyst and you're much more focused, you know, really on the IT perspective, they have a, they look at things a little bit different than, say, a process improvement analyst or even a business intelligence analyst. And so, oftentimes, we let people that are kind of like you know birds of a feather you know kind of flock together. We think that's we think that's a really important way to do things. The other thing is is really how to apply business analysis to various uh, you know project life cycles. So that's kind of the, it's kind of the last piece of this. 
Okay, so now let's get back to what is needed to build business analysis capabilities. And I presented this slide earlier, kind of strategic alignment, governance, processes and practices, information technology, skills and competencies, and culture. Now I kind of covered the information technology aspect, but I haven't really covered these other pieces. So let's cover those. Okay, first of all, when you start planning out business analysis maturity, the best thing is, is to, you know, is to define your capabilities and how you're going to grow. And you really need to do it kind of along these six things, you know, strategic alignment. We really want to kind of move from really no linkage to really tight linkage between um, really, really with the business. Okay, so we're actually helping the business deliver major outcomes. Okay, we actually want to move from kind of uncoordinated governance to much more robust governance in terms of, in terms of how we administer and manage our business analysis practices. We also want to move, move from kind of using various methods into more of a competency center for really uh, defining wh what are the best, best methods that we should use in our organization for defining these processes. Okay, we do need, we really need to move from information technology. We definitely cannot continue to really just use Word. It doesn't support collaboration. It's just limited. It doesn't really support requirement changes. Uh, it's really awkward. So we really need to move off of that into much better tools really to help us perform business analysis. We need to move skills and competencies really where, where now it's kind of individual effort. We encourage everybody to kind of do things, but maybe we need to give people a little bit more e-learning and things like that, more capabilities, more training, and hopefully then build internal champions and, and, and share this knowledge. Okay, and the last one then is really this whole, whole deal dealing with culture. We want to make sure that we, we promote business analysis because, you know, it's our practice. We want our organization to adopt it. We want to be appreciated. So let's take each one of these things. Let's just kind of walk through them. Okay, strategic alignment. The first thing is, is to really define, okay, a role of a business analyst. It sounds simple, but uh, you do a search on business analysis roles, and you'll find out they are all over the place. And I, and I, I went to the uh, IBA conference in Florida, and I, I met with a lot of business analysts, and I talked to them all the time on the phone. And what they do, it varies so much. And so you really need to define, okay, what is a role for a business analyst within your organization? And it may be broader than what you do now, but really what should it be? What's the 2B role? And define that and try to achieve that vision. Very important. Next thing is this business alignment. We want to make sure that the services we provide as business analysts, okay, serve the needs of the business, first and foremost. I mean, that's what we're here for. We also want to make sure that our processes and practices align with our project management relationships. Oftentimes, there seems to be tension between project managers and business analysts, and there shouldn't be. So we want to kind of nip that in the bud, and we actually want to solve that problem up front. We want to make sure that we're aligned with project managers. We need to meet with them kind of collectively as a group, and let's iron out some of these, uh, some of the inconsistencies or un unclear responsibilities between the two groups because, I mean, working together makes a successful project, period. Okay, we also want to make sure that we understand how business analysis fits into current and future systems development life cycles. In other words, if we're moving to Agile, we probably need to change how we do requirements, that's for sure. Uh, if we have uh, even customized or modified Agile or if we're moving to, you know, to more buying an ERP system and kind of moving off custom development, okay, then we really need to probably change the way we do business analysis and make sure we're aligned with that. And the last thing really is in strategic capabilities. We really need to make sure, you know, what are the capabilities that we need to really serve our organization. Okay, governance. Um, for starting a community practice, our center of excellence, it's really important that we do have executive support. Uh, trying to start these things just from the grassroots, it works. I tell you, it goes a lot better if you can get you know one or two executive sponsors to support it. So we really need to make sure that we have that kind of going in. The next thing is just really measurement. Okay, if we can measure the success of our business analysis, we will be champions very quickly. So really, effective KPIs need to be in place to measure okay our performance. Okay, we need funding. Uh, funding shows an organizational commitment. All volunteers, it's not going to last very long. In fact, that seems to be the number one cause, at least from best practices from APTC. If, if organizations aren't willing to put any money into it at all, uh, probably isn't going to happen unless you just really have super dedicated people. Uh, but some funding is required because you've got to pay for training and you've got to pay for you know, coordination and, and where you're going to store your knowledge, et cetera. And the last thing is you need to have a clear charter. I mean, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish here? 
very important because people need to understand, okay, why are we doing this? And you will go through these, these peaks where you kind of go up and down. So having the charter clearly defined makes a big difference. So the next thing is, is processes and practices. Okay, the key thing there is it's, you do need to really work on having some type of business analysis framework or methodology that describes the task of performing business analysis activities. Like I said, in our solution, we actually provide that. But, I mean, some of it needs to be customized or modified to fit your organization. You need to have practice guidelines. You need to have various techniques that you recommend. You know, like Baybach recommends like 100 and they recommend like 42 in their book. Um, however, you know, we've identified probably about 140. But I hope, hopefully organizations don't use every one of those things. You use the ones that fit your organizational needs. You also need to look at, okay, what's the best ways to visualize requirements and what tools should you use? And, of course, one of the best things to share is basically example artifacts. Take successful projects. Make them available for people to share. Extremely important. Okay, information technology, there's really four things that you kind of need to have here. First of all, okay, business analysis software. It's time to move off of Word, time to move off of Excel. You really need to have some type of tool that really provides support for business analysis processes. Next thing we need to have is a tool that really supports collaboration. I mean, that's what business analysis is all about. We have to collaborate with technical and business stakeholders, so we need a tool to help us support that. Okay, the next thing is, is it would be very helpful to have reusable objects and really a way for us to do that. So if we have a way to be able to store uh, examples of good business cases or examples of good requirements or functional requirements checklist or whatever, and things that we could reuse between projects, okay, we need some place to store that. And then really last but not least, we need a system to help us with knowledge management. And, uh, you know, most of the best practices on that is it needs to be kind of knowledge management in the flow. We run into a problem, okay? We need to be able to draw up on our colleagues collectively and find out what's the best way to solve this problem. Okay, so skills and competencies. Okay, first of all, start with a competency model. What, you know, like I said, if you don't have one, and probably even if you do have one, a good one to use is, you know, use IDAs. They've actually identified, you know, all these competencies for a business analyst. Start with that. Um, a lot of business analysts may not have all these competencies. There's nothing to worry about. That's what a competencies model is for. It's really to identify gaps in individuals, work with them then to, to uh, complete those gaps and, and have great skills. Okay, learning and professional development, really key. I mean, the COE, it's a lot better if you kind of coordinate learning and professional development kind of from a company focus. If you have too many people coming in or everybody just goes out and contracts individually, you end up with a lot of scattered processes or whatever. So it's a lot better to try to coordinate learning and professional development so that everybody kind of hears the same message. In other words, maybe have some master contracts with certain providers or whatever. Okay, the next thing is certainly is a reference library. Let people share books and third-party materials and, and make that available to everybody so, this, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's out there. Okay, culture. The culture, I kind of broke this thing into, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of different aspects of culture, but the first thing is, is make sure that you have a strategy so the executives, and I mean C-level executives, see business analysis as strategic to the organization. Your CIO should be all over this. I mean, if, if CIO, I, I was a CIO before, and I can tell you business analysts are absolutely key to a CIO's success. There is nothing probably more important than that because What's their number one issue as a CIO? They want to align IT with the business. How do they do that? Business analyst. You're not going to do that through infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically aligning the applications okay, and our delivery of those services with the business. And that's the key part because we're involved in projects. Certainly technical stakeholders. We need to make sure that they view uh, requirements as needed and valuable to them. Okay, And it helps them have less rework and less frustration. If they view us just as a necessary evil, like, like happens to some organization, we need to try to change that perception. Of course, business stakeholders, um, we, we have to work with them. And we want to make sure they, they also see us as valuable and what services we provide. They understand our role. Half the times they don't understand our role. They say, oh, well, these are just requirements. We gotta, you know, they they want to get on to uh, you know, whatever. They don't want to spend a lot of time. They need to really understand that they do need to spend time. So, I mean, really focusing on those and kind of moving on. Project managers is another one making sure they understand our role, then really even we need to understand our own role really as business analysts. So this is kind of the culture. You take those five boxes, there are changes that probably need to be made to every one of those boxes in terms of really really how to adjust this culture in the organization. 
And we need to have kind of a cohesive strategy and work together as a group. So this kind of boils down, you, you saw kind of part of this chart earlier. This is a little bit different because I, I kind of have the middle thing, but actually kind of changed out the bottom, okay? So really what we have to have is, you know, we have to have business analysis skills, proven processes, effective techniques, tools to support the process. And like I said, I, what we did, or our particular solution is, we looked at this kind of holistically, just kind of a business analysis perspective. And we decided to really be successful in business analysis, you need a lot more than just a tool. So what we did, you get in the bottom, this kind of takes functionality within, within our, our software that we provide. And you can see, I think we, we kind of address every one of these things. We actually give you a community. We give you knowledge that we populate it regularly. We have a lot of e-learning classes, and we actually then have a software tool to kind of support all this stuff and tie everything together. So, uh, and then we, we, we basically view business analysis kind of from start to end, kind of starting at the portfolio level, really moving to benefits to realization, and we try to give you, you know, information to be successful along, along this whole pathway. Uh, like I said, we do provide a framework. This is our framework. It's called the Requirements of Excellence Framework. It actually has 10 task groups. And if you look at it, it's very, very close to BAYBOC, which really isn't a framework. It's really just a you know, body of knowledge. But ours is really a much more, a little bit more task-oriented than a lot of these tasks go on concurrently. But what we do is each one of these tasks, you know, we have like a big write-up of how to do things. So a good example would be, uh, assess, assessing master data impact or assessing the IT service impact. We provide a lot of detailed information and checklist in terms of how to do that. So that's really key in terms of really kind of going forward. So really the next steps is, you know, please visit our website. We do, we do publish a lot of information and we do make things available. Um, actually, this whole presentation will be made available. So you know, I, I know we oftentimes get that question, okay, it will be made available, we'll be emailing it to you. We actually have some extra information we're going to be sending in addition, kind of dealing with business analysis maturity, kind of our research there. And uh, I do encourage you really to look at our product. I think we do take a little different approach. Like I said, we're clearly focused on business analysis. We're clearly focused on helping you be successful. And uh, we provide a lot more than just a tool. Now, I can tell you, a tool is not enough. You do need a tool. Uh, you need really an approach. And you need to basically focus on, like I said, building your skills and governance. And we try to help you along that whole pathway. So, Andrea, I'm going to turn it over to you and see if we have any questions and answers. Sure thing. Um, we do have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to start ask, asking them to you. We might not get to all of them, though, so um, just be aware. My first question is from Humphrey, and he wants to know, how do you measure the BA capability model? Okay, measuring the BA capability model basically is, okay, first of all, you have to define what the capabilities are. So you have to have a BA capability model to begin with, okay? We actually do provide one, and actually some of the stuff that you'll actually be getting from us is, is really how to measure. But the main thing is, is that you measure business analysis capability just like you measure systems development capability. So there's actually, a, you actually go in, you actually do assessment of projects, and you do assessments of of, uh, of of various artifacts, and and you and you can and you validate these things just to make sure you know kind of kind of measuring okay you know where are you performing against really where you should be. So we actually you know there's actually kind of you know where you should be in terms of this capability, and you look at really where you're actually performing, and then you actually then assess you know actually where you are in terms of the capability and the maturity curve. Okay. The next question is from um, Reza, and um, he wants to know, basically, you know, 10 years ago, he was asked what he does, and his answer was, my job is to understand the other people's job, and now he's starting to say, I'm a business analyst, but people still don't really understand that, and his question is, what is the best way to make the industry aware of the BA role? I love that question. Uh, it's really true. Okay, what we have to do there is, number one, we have to define the role ourselves, okay? Uh, when I was, like I said, when I went to IBA's conference, actually, you know, Building Business Capability Conference in Florida, I, I talked to so many people. They're so great just to kind of interact, you know, one-on-one -on -one in person versus on the phone. It was wonderful. But anyway, it, it's amazing. Our role is so undefined, and even, even they haven't really clearly defined their role. So, number one, we really need to define our role. We need to try to organize in a community of practice, and we need to reach agreement on what that role is within our organization and continue to refine it. Because if we can agree upon ourselves, that, that's the first point. Then the next step is, 
is then to develop, okay, communication strategies in terms of how we're going to communicate that role. So first of all, we need to get that role into the hands of the business. We need to go meet with the project management uh, office, if there is one, and, and, and say this is the way we view our role. We want to make sure that you agree our role. Let's look at overlaps. Uh, let's go meet with some development teams. Let's make sure that they kind of understand our role and how we fit into a project. So it is a process and it does take time. But that is extremely important. That's really the place to start. You start with defining your role, reaching agreement in the business analysis community, and then actually communicating that plan out. Great. And here's one from Art. He says, um, we have some business units who use just BAs and others who have BSAs who do a handoff to BAs. He'd appreciate your comments on the benefit or lack thereof for having two distinct roles. Great. Another great question, and you see that all the time too. Okay, basically, those two roles really need to merge. Um, a business systems analyst and a business analyst, okay, one interfaces more with IT, so the BSAs oftentimes they're more associated on the IT side, the business analysts are more focused on the, the business process side. What happens is you have a lot of redundancy tasks, you have frictions when that occur, so I would really totally recommend that this would be a great thing. Number one, start a community of practice in terms of uh, getting both those groups to work together and then work long term into organizational changes that need to be made, okay, in terms of kind of kind of merging those functions together. That will definitely take some time because there's, you know, there will be some politics involved there. And I'm not saying, okay, the BA should either report to the business or IT. That's another, that's another decision that should be made. The main thing is it really should be consistent. And the big thing is just to get these people to work together and really realize that working together, okay, they'll actually achieve a lot more. But really, Having an extra handoff like that is really, really awkward because now you have you know, two people defining requirements. Uh, you have two people kind of performing business analysis function. Understand the BAs are probably much more on, on the process side, but the other ones have to define the requirements for this. And so it really does work better if they're actually just kind of one group. And hopefully the uh, BSAs get, get converted into BAs that they actually that is kind of spokesman for the business and for IT. Okay. Here's one from Kevin. He says, um, generally, at what scale is the BA, COE, an appropriate investment? And then the second question to this is, how many people in BA roles within an organization do you need to do this? Oh. Okay. Um, you can start a C okay, really, what type of investment is, okay, the investment, uh, you know, so the, the investment is in terms of, like, the number of, number of people, you can start off very small. I mean, you could actually have a COE with, with four or five or six people. And actually, there's a lot of economies of scale of doing that because you, uh, you're having consistent practices, you gain efficiencies, and you're actually able to use kind of a scarce resource uh, more efficiently by doing that. Okay? You know, how many people should an organization have? That's a tough question because that really depends a lot on the industry. Uh, you'll find that, like, you know, insurance and financial services, they're going to need a lot more, say, probably than manufacturing or, you know, or big retail companies or whatever. Not that, it's, not that you don't have a lot in both, both of those. It's just that uh, I'll guarantee you the number of analysts in, uh, in a large insurance company would be significantly more than in, like, a, a, re a big retail organization like Walmart. So it really does vary by industry. But the big thing is, is there are some guidelines, you know, for that. And here's a question from, from Amy about Agile. She wants to know, how would you recommend helping people understand that the role of the business analyst in Agile helps define the product backlog? Another great question. Well, anyway, this, Agile's kind of changing a lot. Um, and we actually use Agile as our own development method. I mean, actually, we have, we have we use Scrum, and we actually have moved completely to Agile within our organization to use our own tool for that. But, okay, the role of a business analyst, first of all, there's, there's two answers to that. Number one is, there, in, in Agile, there is a role called the product owner. And the product owner basically does many, many things that a business analyst does. So number one, the business analyst can either, either play the role of the product owner and actually just call themselves the product owner versus the business analyst, which I don't like that. But uh, in terms of the Scrum and Agile world, that's, that role is very, very well defined. And, and there's, there's training that you can get for that. And basically, it's very, very much I mean, what a business analyst do because they define the product backlogs. 
Okay, that's so that's that's kind of then the second step is even when there is a, if if the business analyst is not the product owner but they're still working on an agile project, they add a lot of value because they work closely with the product owner, who's more like a still like serving like a lead VA. But what they do, they interface much more with the business, and so the product owner is kind of just you know kind of just the coordinator in terms of coordinating multiple VAs efforts or whatever. So the, again, that goes back to defining the, the role clearly of what the business analyst does, reaching agreement, and then really you know, uh, publicizing that role. There is, uh, there is clearly a role for a business analyst on agile projects. In fact, uh, that's <clears throat> generally that's kind of the major interface between the development team, and generally it's, you know, they're supposed to interface with the user directly, right? That's part earlier is what Agile is supposed to be. When we're interfacing with the users, they're probably interfacing more with the VA who's actually interfacing with the users because they can't interface with I mean, all the users that are out there and oftentimes, but they do need a lot of expertise. Okay, next question. Okay, from Daniel. How can a BA course be useful for a low-level maturity company? <clears throat> oh, that's another great question. Okay, basically, um, it helps a lot because you have to start someplace, right? How are you ever going to have a higher maturity level if you don't start with basically, okay, you, core competencies and training for your people? So number one, you have to be able to kind of bring your people up. So it takes a little bit of time to get there, but uh, you need to have like a plan. I think I have this one, one thing that kind of, kind of moves you along. Most organizations are very, very low maturity. So what they need to do is they need to start really with training and get people on board in terms, in terms of what are they doing. So, so that's even more appropriate for uh, low maturity organizations than it is high maturity organizations. If you look at it like here, if you look at the thing called skills and competencies, right now it's kind of individual effort. We don't, we don't really have you know, common ways of doing things. So the first thing is running people through a training course so they have a common view of what a business analyst is and what they do and how they help out the business. That's really the first step of building maturity. And generally, in terms of really moving to higher levels of maturity, it may be uh, a four to eight year process depending on your organization. It's hard to do, hard to really move to a high level of maturity in less than four years. Okay, got a question about KPIs. I'm from Alexander. Could you give examples of applicable KPIs? Um, actually, I have, I have a lot of valuable KPIs and so as part of our handout materials, I'm actually going to include that. I, I, I can't really pull, I actually have, I have a lot of them that actually define them. One, one is the amount of, I actually broke them out between business analysis KPIs and requirements KPIs. So you'll actually get that as part of your handout. And I actually have a whole section just on that. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, I will be emailing, my, my name is Andrea, and you'll be getting an email from Andrea Paulton with um, this presentation, a link to the Modern Analyst Live presentation, and also to, uh, to this kit that we have for you. It has a, some valuable material in there. I'll try to get it out by Friday. Um, to continue the Q&A, um, I have one from Janelle. She wants to know, how do you measure BA success, and how do you measure BA performance? Hmm, another great question. Okay, basically, okay, that's kind of related to these KPIs. The first thing is, is to define KPIs for the business analysis function. And there are a lot of KPIs, like I said, I'm going to give you in terms of the kit. But the main thing is, is to define the KPIs that are appropriate and set up a measurement program to actually measure that success. And you measure the success depending on the KPI. Some of it's measured monthly. Some of it's measured at the end of a project. Some of it's measured you know, after the project's been in live. And some of it involves uh, having a, a technical satisfaction ratio and a business satisfaction ratio. And certainly one of the best measures is, is uh, work with the business to define uh, business outcomes they want to achieve. Measure those business outcomes after the, after the solution went live. If you help them, if, if, if they achieve those outcomes, I'll guarantee you the business analyst was a big part of that. And, and actually, you, you, if you start with that, helping the business define their outcomes, measure their outcomes all the way through the process, um, that's probably one of the best ways really to measure the success of the business analysis function. I actually have some very specific just for BI, you know, but that's probably the best. Measure the success of business outcomes. Okay, and I have a three-part question from Mesa. Is this BA capability model the same as CMMI? If not, how are they different? 
And the second question is, how does the capability apply to agile oriented projects? Okay, great question. Okay, no, it is not the same thing as CMMI. CMMI actually only has two capabilities. They're called requirements development and requirements management. They do not have a, a business analysis capabilities defined at all. So the bottom line is, I would love to use CMMI. I'd love for them to have you know capabilities defined for business analysis. They do not. They only have requirements development and requirements management, which is like two pieces of it. Okay, so really, how does this actually apply to Agile? Well, one of the big things on business analysis is is making sure okay you're delivering value to the business and you're aligned. So it really doesn't matter too much on what the system's development life cycle is. Uh, capabilities are needed regardless of what the life cycle is. They're actually needed, you know, whether you buy package, you buy software, you outsource your development, you have agile, or you have, you know, waterfall development. So really the KPIs that are defined for business analysts apply across all, all, all development back and life cycles. Okay. And Joe wants to know about the Focus Requirement Suite. Um, how are the requirements managed in the system? And are they tacked um, to a silo or are they listed generically by function? Okay, um, they're managed, okay, basically in our system, we actually manage requirements. We actually have two key concepts. Okay, we start off with defining solution scope. The solution scope is defined as a set of high level features. Then we use those features really to control scope because you can actually prioritize features much easier than you can prioritize 500 to 1,000 detailed requirements. It just doesn't work. You can't, you can't prioritize features. Now, features then are really easily understood by the business, and you can normally have like a business owner that's responsible for each one. So we use those features basically to define a set of requirements that go into a product backlog. Now, out of this backlog, we're going to give things to development maybe a little different than what our features are. We may group multiple features together. We may split a feature and, and, and give it to development differently because we may give it to them by agile sprints, which may be one, one week, two weeks, three weeks, or whatever. So when we pull requirements out of the backlog, we put them into what's called a bundle, and we work with whoever we're giving that bundle to. So if it's a if we're outsourcing part of the development, we would create a bundle, which basically equates to a work order. We give that like to the outsourcing firm. If it's an internal development team, we actually give them a bundle. We reach agreement on that this is the scope of the bundle. And then, and then we basically baseline that bundle and then control all changes really kind of going forward. So we really think what you have to do, you have to control what's going into the backlog, which is features. You have to control what's coming out of the backlog, which is bundles. And we actually then have controls really for both because we actually have you know, kind of defined state machines to control. Okay, features are really what you use to communicate with the business and make sure that you derive value. Bundles is basically your implementation and how you're actually going to interface with your, your technical team, whether they're development or whether they're waterfall or whatever. Frankly, you know, not having that, I think that's where a lot of requirement tools fail. You can't just give somebody, you know, a thousand requirements in one big document anymore. That that's kind of doesn't work. It doesn't even work in waterfall because waterfall is often off often phased. It certainly doesn't work in agile. And that's one of the big changes that you have to do in terms of kind of modern business analysis is make, make that transition. Okay, and then we're running out of time, so this is going to be our last question um, from Shabina. How do you distinguish between business requirements and stakeholder requirements? Well, good question. A lot of people really get confused by those two. They really are quite different. Okay, business requirements are tied to directly to business outcomes. I want to increase sales by 10%. I want to reduce my days in receivables. I want to uh, uh, reduce, reduce inventory by $300,000. So they're usually very specific and they're really tied to specific business outcomes and very measurable. Okay, stakeholder requirements really mean I'm really much more focused on the user, okay? So I'm really focused on user activities. And so what I'm looking at, in order to support an accounts payable clerk that's using my system, I need to understand what she needs to do, what, what activities does she does, and then what are, what are the needs that she has to make her job more efficient, okay? And generally at that level, they don't really care about the business requirements. All they really care about is can, can you make, can you make my, my, my job easier? Can you relieve pressure on me you know, and, and, uh, and give me information I need to perform my function better? So the stakeholder needs are much more organized around user activities. Business is much more geared around outcomes of the business. Okay, thank you, John, for a very informative presentation. Thank you to everyone for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar sponsored by InFocus Solutions. I wanted to point out the webinar along with the slides will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. 
And this concludes today's event. So we hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.